Welcome to episode 309 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on November 11th, 2022. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. Today, we dive back into a couple of Office 365 topics and mix in some PowerShell for the fun of it. We discuss a blog post about syncing Teams files, aka SharePoint files, with OneDrive, and the general availability of PowerShell 7.3 in one particular issue to be aware of. And then finally, we wrap up with cross-tenant user data migration for Office 365 reaching general availability. Scott, remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about an interesting question we saw on Reddit? I can't remember what I did yesterday, but I do remember this somehow. Do you remember this? So I found an interesting blog post on tech community. And I don't know that we're going to put this in the show notes because this was interesting in that my intention is not to make fun of this person, but it was a blog post that had said how to sync files to a local computer. And it started off with that Teams has the ability... How to sync Teams files. To how to sync computer. Teams files, right. Teams files to a local computer. And it talks about how Teams has this integration to OneDrive to synchronize files and folders. And like this question of how to make it work. And this particular individual actually went through and wrote an entire blog post. I mean, this is like a page or two blog post because they were confused about all of the numerous articles on how to sync. So he wanted to help others out. And it talks about how you go through to files and then within Teams files, which it talks about then opening in SharePoint, which yes, Teams files are SharePoint. Let's clear that up right now. There is no such thing as Teams files. There are SharePoint files that are surfaced in Teams associated with the Teams, but they're SharePoint files. That's the first thing you need to know. But it's <laughs> nothing confusing at all there. No, sure. Nothing all confusing. Makes sense. It, yeah. But it goes through how you can go to files and teams and open in SharePoint, which is very much a thing. And then you can go view these files in SharePoint and use the sync button in SharePoint to sync the files down from the general folder. The article he wrote, very valid. To me, it is much more extensive than it needs to be because in that same drop down menu, from the three dots, the ellipses, up at the top of your Teams files. So you go to Teams, you go to Files, you have New, Upload, Edit, and Grid View, Share, Copy Link, and then an ellipses. Like three links above that is actually a sync button that will sync those files via OneDrive to your computer. Again, very valid way to do it. You can absolutely go to SharePoint and sync from there, but you can also just use the sync button right in Teams to sync these OneDrive fi- or these SharePoint files through OneDrive to your computer without having to go through all of this. I can see how somebody's confused about this, though, because you think the files live in Teams, but then there's this, hey, open this in the other place thing. Right. Like, are they disconnected? Are they the same thing? Like, the cognitive load to figure some of this stuff out, the burden is real. Yeah, and for a lot of normal users, I can absolutely, to your point, see how they could get confused and... We've talked about naming, I've talked about some naming before, how stuff doesn't help and how people talk about Teams files. And a lot of this confusion, I feel like, could just be alleviated by talking about these things properly. Not referring to Teams files and SharePoint files, but it's files in Teams that are SharePoint files. I don't know, like, it's hard, it's confusing, but understanding some of this goes a long ways to to your point. Understanding how this works, that those two are actually the same thing, that it is one copies of files surfaced in two different ways. I described this to someone the other day we were talking about this. It's two doors to the same house. You can come in through Teams or you can come in through SharePoint. You can come in through the front door or the back door. At the end of the day, you're still getting into the same spot, same files, same everything. Yeah, I'd love to hear if anybody is kind of struggled with this in their organizations, like ping us on Twitter or send us an email through the contact form, things like that. Just how you're handling user adoption and the confusion around things like Teams versus SharePoint, really versus like any embedded workload, right? You've got all the apps in there with things like Viva, you've got Planner. 
Yeah, maybe I'm a little too close to it. I'd love to hear how others are kind of treating user adoption in this space and how they introduce tooling and and train people on it. Like Microsoft has a bunch of community adoption it's toolkits and things like that out there. But, you know, I don't know that uh-huh. it works for folks who don't know the way Microsoft works. Yeah, I would agree with that. And like, I work with clients, so I have tried to educate people on this as I work with them. But I think a real challenge is if, well, one, if you're a bigger company and you maybe don't have somebody coming in, or even smaller companies. You're a five, ten person shop, you go out and buy Office 365, you roll this out. You don't necessarily have the time, maybe you don't even have the technical staff that are helping you, that are working through this, to help you understand it. And it can There's a lot of documentation out there. There's a lot of information. So figuring out, like, how do you actually educate people on this? How do people educate themselves on this if they don't have those resources? Yeah, I'll put some links in the show notes. It's interesting. The Microsoft adoption toolkits and what they've got out there. So there's a whole flipbook on Teams adoption. There's a customer success kit. But my my experience with these, and I, I think it's because I'm a little too close to it, has been that they're very Microsoft-centric. So they start off with a context that you kind of have to walk in knowing what SharePoint is to be introduced to Teams properly. And you can't do that every place you go. Like You're always going to have information workers who think just a computer is a computer. There's no distinction between Word, Excel, or Outlook. They're all just like my job. I think that's where I'd like to hear some ideas from others. Like If you found a helpful resource or a blog or some other community where (laughs) I can get some more perspective on it. (laughs) This is a good point too. So... David in the Discord chat says they try to train users, but they don't make time to listen. They don't want to understand. They do get some of the IT training on day one, but that's mixed in with a whole bunch of other training. So it just gets lost. It gets forgotten. They're drinking from a fire hose. And I would agree with that too. I think that can be a challenge that comes across or comes up. And I think the always changing too is another aspect of this would be how do you continue to train users and continue to educate them? Or how do you send them certain resources so that as they continue to work and they maybe like get dripped this training over time to help them absorb it a little more rather than that drink from the fire hose in the first day or the first week? Yes, this is a very real challenge. So anybody that has input, input insight, thoughts, comments. Let us know Twitter, come join us in Discord, or comment. We have comments. We don't get a lot of those. We have comments. You can comment on the blog post on the RSS feed on the website that goes along with this. Yeah, thanks. Now we're going to get some spam. All right. And at the end of the day, Teams is tough. What else is going on out there? You were uh, we were chatting earlier. You're playing around with the latest release of PowerShell, so PowerShell seven point three G eight. Well, seven point three G eight. I would say I'm sort of playing around with it. I, <laughs> this is another challenge. You want me to? I could get another soapbox here. So seven point three G eight. I actually run the PowerShell preview version of PowerShell on my Mac. So I haven't actually upgraded to 7.3 GA yet because 7.3 general availability, either they messed up, the brew upgrade is messed up, or because this is a GA release, it doesn't get pushed into the preview branch. So I'm still on 7.3 release candidate one. I don't know if 7.3 GA is going to come, but I did see it is GA'd. It was just a couple days ago. Support it on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, a variety of ways to get it, video demos built on .NET 7. Kind of at the same time, it made me laugh. At the same time as 7.3 G8, you can now use 7.2 in Azure Automation, <laughs> since we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, you know, it's on that forward-looking release train. So one comment for you there. You mentioned like you manage yeah. that through Brew locally, but, or maybe folks might do it through like like 
So Homebrew on kind of the Mac yes. OS side of the fence is just a command line package manager, similar to Winget or Chocolatey if you're on the Windows side. Those are community maintained things. Like it's not necessarily like Microsoft goes out and says like, oh, I'm going to push the new package into Brew. Like somebody has to go and set that up. So I wouldn't have the expectation that those things are there on day one in those package managers in the in, the, in that way. On day one. Usually, so I think Microsoft does, well, it is community driven. I'm pretty sure Microsoft does go in and contribute to the community in that way because I have noticed, I would agree, not always day one. Usually within a day or two, it does show up in Homebrew. So it stays fairly well updated, but yeah, it's not always there. And I have seen it before. I don't know 100% how Homebrew works with these different releases, but occasionally I have noticed a tag gets messed up or something too when they go out to push it. Yeah. And I do have to go out and manually update. It's all who maintains the cask and same thing in Wicket, like who, who win get rather, uh, you know, right. who maintains that repository and, and how does it come together? So like I was just looking at the, the, the main cask has been updated to 7.3 right now. So it, it is there. Yeah, 7.3. Okay. So has the main cask, what about the preview cask? Because there's the PowerShell preview cask that's different from the main cask. And that's not always the one that gets the same GA push. Like I may end up updating like to 7.4 beta the next time it gets pushed. But all that aside, if you are on the general availability cask of all those, if you are using... PowerShell 7 and not PowerShell 5. 7.3 is GA'd. However, before you upgrade to it, there is an issue that I apparently have not been doing enough of lately that you called my attention to where a bunch of Azure (laughs) stuff is broken in (laughs) 7.3. So where I've seen this manifest itself is specifically in the Azure Compute resource provider, so az.compute. If so if you're doing Azure PowerShell and you've upgraded to Azure Power or to PowerShell 7.3 because you said, "Ooh, new shiny at G8, it's ready to go. We're out of RCs or preview modes, things like Who that." Who does that? You know, I, I know you're a preview person, but generally speaking, like, "Hey, GA, let's let's go ahead and get up to that." Right. You will see just things start to break along the way. So it looks like one of the kind of innumerable resources within certain commands is just completely broken. Like it's off in formatting or it's just violating some constraint <laughs> like internally within the PowerShell module itself. Tread lately with this. Like I've only seen the one issue in AZ Compute so far and, and run into that one, but you might run into it with other resource providers. I don't know if you'd hit it with certain commandlets within, you know, say like networking or if you're doing like websites, things like that. Like, I don't know, you might want to be prepared to fall back to the CLI, like if this is like steady state on your desktop, or, you know, maybe you have flexibility with your environment to get off of 7.3 and go backwards a little bit until some of these issues are worked out. If this is something that hits you, like there's an open issue on GitHub, you know, I'll put a link in the show notes for everybody. Like you're running into this week later and you're going like, why is this still broken? Like go follow along on GitHub and, you know, maybe provide some inputs there just to help the team understand overall impact and how things are broken out in the world. Yeah, I haven't tried it because there was a comment from four hours ago where it says the release candidate fixed it for me. I would not think the release candidate would be ahead of the generally available update. I suppose maybe there was something in there that didn't make it into GA. I have not tried it. I was actually just trying to log in while you were talking to see if I could do like a get AZVM. And if I saw an error or what happened from that perspective for me. Yeah, something broke along the whole like preview RC train. It it was working early on in the previews, so I I don't know. Something was just, you know, went off a little bit on the rails there, but it'll get fixed. Yep, keep an eye on that GitHub issue and hopefully get updated. 
Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees, they want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intellijink.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. So there was some other generally available. Should we move on to other generally available stuff? What else did I say was generally available? <laughs> Cross-tenant user data migration is now generally available, Scott. It is. It is, it is for sure. I have not tried this. Maybe we should baseline. Do you want to kind of walk through what this is? What that is? Yeah, so, I, I was. I kind of ignored this while it was in preview and everything. I was like, uh, I don't know, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I watched it in preview. I have heard of people using it successfully Again, I have not tried it. I will say, generally speaking, this still leaves a shortfall in what I typically need to do. But what this user data migration, cross-tenant user data migration is, is another Microsoft 365 or Office 365 thing, going back to naming. This should work in either one of those is it allows you to do a tenant-to-tenant migration of some of your data. I would say typically when you do this, it is you end up either downloading a bunch of data, disconnecting from one tenant, reconnecting to a tenant, and letting all that data upload. You can do exports and then imports. You could go off and buy some third-party tools to allow you to do a tenant-to-tenant migration. But this is a cross-tenant data migration to go from one Office 365 tenant to another, primarily or really focused on a cross-tenant mailbox migration and a cross-tenant OneNote migration. OneDrive migration. OneDrive, sorry. OneDrive, not OneNote. OneDrive migration where you can now go in as an admin, complete user data migration to... Really, this would be more like merging tenants. Maybe you made an acquisition or somehow you ended up with a couple different tenants or maybe you went and bought... I saw this come up the other day related to this, Scott. You went and bought a GoDaddy tenant and you defederated it and then wanted to get rid of that nasty URL and actually migrate out of that GoDaddy environment into your own tenant, this would be a scenario where that would work. But again, it is only OneDrive and Mail. So this does not appear that this would account for doing things like Teams conversations or if you have a whole bunch of SharePoint sites with SharePoint files in it. Planner plans, that type of stuff that lives outside of those two technologies, it's not really going to account for those. But there are, I would say there's a fair amount of tenants that really are just using email, or maybe they're just using email in OneDrive and they want to move to a different tenant or merge a couple tenants together. This should give you a little bit easier way to merge two tenants or to move a mailbox from one tenant to another? Easier, yes. Uh, There's some (laughs) things to watch out for here. A, like, hey, does it work with the workloads you want? It is workload constrained to just exchange and just to OneDrive, not to SharePoint sites. There's some uh, weird constraints here. They're not weird constraints. They're just things you need to know. Like if I'm going to migrate, you know, Scott at tenant A over to Scott at tenant B and do that OneDrive migration, if I have a OneDrive already in the destination 
the migration is going to fail. Like it's not going to go through because it's not going to overwrite it or things like that. There is also a licensing component here. So I, I don't know if you saw this, but cross-tenant data migration is an add-on for EA customers. <laughs> and the user licenses are per migration. So it's kind of like a one-time fee. You have to reach out to Microsoft and get them as a tack-on thing. So it's licensed as an add-on license, and you have to be licensed on both sides. Uh, so you have to have a license in both the source and destination tenant. That, that one's a little weird, right? Because you can't buy licenses oh, right. for less than a year. <laughs> like, uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how this all composes and comes together. So it could be a kind of pricey affair versus maybe going with a ISV, you know, like uh, I'd, I'd go look at like ShareGate or something like that potentially. And that's usually what I do just because... Again, for me, most of the time you're looking at something else. The documentation on that whole licensing thing too is odd. So if you read it, it says cross-tenant user data migration is available as an add-on, like you said, to the following subscription plans, pretty much everything for enterprise agreement customers. What if I don't have an enterprise agreement? You don't migrate. <laughs> not when not with this. Yeah, eligibility for the add-on license is limited. Do you have to have an EA to migrate? Uh, per, the, per, per the way those words are written, yes. I was just logging into my CSP portal to see if I can buy these. Because I wonder how many enterprises would actually do this. This feels like more of, again, like that SMB thing or get off of Google thing or something that would target SMBs more so than it would enterprises. I don't know very many, many enterprises that do tenant to tenant. Well, this targets a very niche like M&A kind of thing. It, would it be good to have for those segments that you talked about? Like, Would it be nice to have cross-tenant migrations that are officially supported by Microsoft for every tenant type out there from SMBs to enterprises? Yes. Is it worth Microsoft's time to do that? Yeah, maybe not. Because SMB is like, if I'm an SMB, I don't want to pay for licenses on both sides. That's not so, like, I would just consider that to probably be too much versus an enterprise, like, hey, this is just a cost of doing business. And, and frankly, in MA scenarios, like, you're going to be licensed in the source tenant already because you're coming from that organization. And the new organization is yep. going to have to license you again in, in theirs. That's just the reality of the world. Like, you are going to be enabled and licensed in both places. It's not like, oh, hey, I went out and bought a new franchise and I had to, you know, move five users over or something like that. Like in those cases, you should be probably looking to ISVs or partners to fill the gap for you. Right. But in an M&A scenario, we're going to go down the usefulness of this now. In an M&A scenario, is it really only going to be OneDrive and mailboxes that you're going to want to migrate? Yes. I'm going to say yes, because there's all sorts of, I think, regulatory and compliance weirdness that come into play here. So say it's like an FSI migration, it's pretty uh -huh. easy for me to constrain things with retention policies and all that. But if I'm like if I'm a big bank buying a smaller bank, it's very likely that my kind of regulatory compliance landscape looks different from the organization that I'm acquiring. So I frankly don't want their team's messages. Like I just don't want it to come through. I don't want the ad hoc garbage. It might even be that like you don't have your environment configured that way. Like if you think about it, bringing over things like mailboxes and OneDrives is totally a happy path. Like these are products that are fairly easy to configure for retention on both sides. Like I could go into the source right. tenant and say, I just bought you. Great, let's go configure our exchange mailbox retention and everything around user mailboxes. We'll let that run for a period of time, make sure it cleans everything out. Okay, great, we're going to do our migration. I know I've only migrated the last year of data, the last 60 days of data, whatever it happens to be. And then I delete that mailbox and I'm done with it. Like You don't want to, in these situations, have to be scrubbing individual teams' messages and, and put a team together to figure that all out. It's not sustainable. 
sustainable. All of that and a lot of the other content you're going to want to sort through and not just do bulk migrations. Same thing. SharePoint sites are going to be in right. 100% the same category. Like, I think these are safe space areas because really we're talking about users at this point and user enablement. We're not talking about like business process enablement that might be coming out of like a, a public team or a private team or a SharePoint site that stood up around a business process. Like the organization that acquired you might not really care too much about your H, your legacy HR process because you're all going to come over into the new HR process on the other side. Like they care on how to transition you, but that's a process problem. That's not like, hey, I need to bring over all your PDFs from last year problem. Yeah. Okay. You might, you have managed to sort of convince me. I'll go with that. <laughs> Merges and acquisitions are totally a weird space. And the bigger organizations get, like the higher up the food chain you go, the more guardrails that are put in place that you need to adhere to as the organization being acquired and as the one doing the acquiring. Like it does get super painful, super fast. Yeah, I can see that. But yeah, we'll put links to these documents too because even Exchange Mailboxes, OneDrive too, it has to be like read-write permissions. There's stuff with mailboxes, not being able to migrating mailboxes on hold. So if you have a legal hold on a mailbox, this doesn't work. So there are definitely things to be aware of when it comes to these cross-tenant migrations. Yeah. So something to be mindful here of, like if you are eligible for this path and it's something you want to look at, you talk to your account team, things like that, like how is it safe to do? Like, like where are some additional guardrails that you might not get with something like a share gate that's out there? Like this is effectively, you're going to establish a trust between your two tenancies. So there's a process that you go through, like say in the case of like OneDrive migrations, where you're going to connect the two tenants together and say like, yes, I am allowed to migrate between these two. So you're going to need to be a SharePoint Online admin, or you're going to have to be an M365 global admin on each side to go ahead and establish this, where you're going to go down the path of connecting tenant A to tenant B, and then on tenant B, verifying that, hey, I do want like tenant A to be able to connect to me and bring that data off. So it's not like this is just a, a one-off migration tool kind of thing. It's also, I think, built a little bit for scale. So when you talk about like OneDrive migrations, like your migration batches, like, you know, back to this might not be for an MS SMB thing. <laughs> Batch sizes are 4,000. You're moving a decent chunk at a time to run in a batch. Yeah, are there batch size limits for mailboxes too? I didn't look. I did not batch. see any off the top of my head. There, there, there batch, might be. Batch, create migration batches, batch, batch, batch. Because I know like a normal exchange migration, I think the max batch size is 2,000 mailboxes. I was curious how this compared. Do not exceed 2,000 mailboxes per batch for this as well. So it's probably using a lot of those migration endpoints that you would do. So on the exchange side, it's just using the migration batch like commandlets and kind of the built-in exchange web services stuff. Yeah. Uh, if you need guidance for mailbox quantities over 50,000, you can reach out to engineering and talk to them <laughs> with an email address. So if you have a batch over 50,000, there's an email address in this article. You can email them. There you go. OneDrive, I did notice too that you are limited to like two terabytes and a million items. So if you have massive OneDrives, because you can get OneDrive higher than two terabytes and more than one million items, this will also not work. So your OneDrive has to be within those constraints. So general availability. You had one more. Do you want to try to talk about one more generally available feature? We're kind of coming up to time. Uh, I think that'll be a little bit longer. So we should talk about All that right. in the future. We'll save that one for another episode. Something to look forward to once we kill all these fruit flies in our house. <laughs> Indeed. Once we kill the fruit flies. All right. Well, thanks. It was good discussion, Scott. Yep. I'm gonna all right. I'm gonna get out of here. Get back to my uh hurricane cleanup and get back to raking the get yard. Back. Do you have a mess? Uh yeah, we had a lot of uh just leaves, trees down. 
things like that. Some of the the area I live in is kind of bordered on one side by the Intracoastal Waterway, and then I'm bordered on the other side by the Atlantic Ocean. So you, you know, uh-huh. you talk about kind of sea level on two sides, and then potentially just a little bit of like Florida elevation, kind of in the middle where I am. So normally, like say like high tide for the Intracoastal, you've probably got a good like three, four feet of play in like the seawall before you'd kind of crest over it. So we were down there driving around yesterday, which is about half a mile from our house. It was up over the seawall, like at high tide by a good like four or five feet. It was kind of crazy. <laughs> I haven't seen it that way before. Yeah, I was watching some, we are a ways off. So differences when you talk about like a big difference in elevation, we are like 30-ish feet above sea level. So you have to go up a whopping 25 feet in the, I don't know, 10 miles that you go inland between our houses. So we got some wind here and rain, but other than that, like we don't have, we had a few small branches down, like a foot or two, but nothing major here. And I did, I was watching videos of when you did get closer to the water there and the water got up pretty high over some of those seawalls along the river, even in the downtown the St. John's River here in Jacksonville, it got up over that. And uh, yeah. Yeah, here. A little uh, <laughs> wild, especially since this hurricane just kind of popped up out of nowhere. Like I had no idea it was coming until I got the alert on my phone that we had Tropical Storm Watch. And it was like, huh, who knew? <laughs> yeah, I'll throw a picture into Discord so you can see. So this is a bridge. So I guess the part of kind of you know, part of town I live in is technically an island. Like you have to cross the bridges to get back to the mainland. So this is a bridge that's right outside our our neighborhood. But normally you go down there, there's like a nice restaurant. Like that's basically like the parking lot for the boat launch and the restaurant there, which are all the way, like way back on on a bunch of pillars there. So interesting times. Sea rise is real. (laughs) Yes. Well, only 19 more days, Scott, until hurricane season is done. And we have seven months until we do it all over again. There you go. All right. Well, go enjoy cleaning up the yard. Enjoy your weekend, Scott. And we will talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, Ben. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.